Welcome to another edition of Eco Africa. You'll be hearing about some very special people in today's program. I am Sandra Twinovio and I'm joined by my co presenter, Chris Elams, all the way from Nigeria. Hi, Chris. How are you today? Just fine, Sandra. A warm welcome from Nigeria. Before we meet the people who are going above and beyond for the environment, here are a few of the questions we'll be answering on today's show. What is the Great Green Wall? How can houses in South Africa be built more sustainably? And how do small solar energy grids help families in rural Kenya? We promised to introduce you to some special people today, and you're about to meet the first one. This young woman from Malawi has just won an important international award, the Goldman Environmental Prize. Our top story looks at why she absolutely deserves this recognition. Once a month, people all over Malawi take to the streets for a few hours to clean up their towns. But there are ways to turn a chore into something fun. It's always a good conversation starter when you sort of try to dance and try to just engage with people. And I think it's also been a really good way to connect with people and just show them and explain them. And I know it's going to take a lot of time for people to actually change how they see things and how they do things, but it's quite fulfilling to see them come out and actually be part of it. Gloria Majiga Kamoto encourages people to take responsibility for the cleanliness of their neighborhoods. After all, not all areas can rely on official waste collection. And even in places that can, the service is often irregular. The drainage system is constantly clogged. Yes, when they take those rubbish there, they drop inside there. In Malawi, most waste ends up in landfills. Some people try to eke out a living, sifting through the trash for things to resell. But there are other opportunities to make good use of the rubbish too. Gloria Majiga Kamoto has partnered with a local company that takes bottles and other waste plastics. Once it's been cleaned and shredded, it can then be used as a raw material to make other things, like bricks. This thing is 60% sand, it is 20% thinner plastic and 10% pet thicker plastic and then you get this, which is stronger than concrete. Around 60,000 tons of plastic waste is generated in Malawi each year. Frustrated by that, Majiga Kamoto joined fellow activists in battling the plastics industry, pushing the government and the courts to outlaw plastic products, a fight she continues in her job at the NGO, the Center for Environmental Policy and Advocacy. Techniques have ranged from lobbying and legal action to protests. Malawi became one of the first countries in Africa to impose a ban on single-use plastics. But the plastics industry challenged the decision and it's been hard to enforce. A walk around the market is a reminder that there's still a long way to go. So he has, he's actually got a huge stock right in the back there. And it's, I mean, it's, it is very frustrating because by now, what we had hoped was that in the last two years, since the ban had been enforced in the time that it was brought in, by now we would not have seen any of these plastics at all. Majiga Kamoto says he could encourage his customers to bring their own reusable bags. He agrees that it's a good idea. This year, Majiga Kamoto was awarded the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize for her efforts to promote sustainability. She also celebrated another milestone. In cooperation with the government, her organization is launching Malawi's first national waste management plan. It's still in the proposal stage, but the country's Minister for Natural Resources is optimistic about its prospects. There has to be that pressure for things to happen, for movement to happen. There's been issues in courts for a long time that have nothing has happened to them. But on this one, we've made headway because of people, civil society, and people like her working very hard to make sure that this is uh, done. Having gained such recognition for her work, Gloria Majiga Kamoto isn't afraid to dream big. Ten years, I might just be the president, who oh, knows? <laughs> but you definitely know my name. <laughs> 
Climate change, drought, water shortages. Most reports coming out of the Sahel region are alarming, especially considering it was once a lush fertile region. But there have been long plans to restore the area to its former glory. Back in the 1980s, an initiative was launched to rejuvenate a broadband that stretches across the continent. It was christened the Great Green Wall. So how is this visionary idea coming along? This vast area is just a small part of what's to be the Great Green Wall of the Sahara and the Sahel. Over the last decade, more than 10 million trees have been planted here in Senegal, one of the initiative's leading countries. Acacias survive well in the dry soil, but they can't make it on their own. The seedlings need regular care, which presents a challenge. We buy the seedlings, we give them a lot of water. But then the plants are left alone and they die. It's a waste. As it stands today, more than 60% of African's terrain is unsuitable for farming. Climate change is particularly noticeable in the Sahel region. In the past, there was drought about once a decade. Now it's every two years. There's less and less food and water for more than 30 million people who live here. Conceived to combat desertification, the tree planting initiative was launched by the African Union in 2007. The Great Green Wall spans 11 countries from Senegal to Djibouti. It will be 15 kilometers wide and almost 8,000 kilometers long. Ten bordering countries have also joined the Pan-African movement. Financial support comes mainly from the UN, the World Bank and the EU, but progress has been slow. Not even a quarter of the route has been planted. Haida El Ali, the new Great Green Wall Country Director for Senegal, wants to speed up implementation and involve local populations more. Here too, the project is still not widely known. In 10 years, this is the first time anyone has come here to talk about the Great Green Wall and explain its purpose. A lot of persuasion and resources are still needed if the 100 million hectares Great Green Wall project is to be completed by 2030 as planned. It's really an ambitious project with a lofty goal. To succeed, it will take people who believe in the vision and are actively committed to restoring the Sahel. That is right, Chris. And Haider El Ali is one of those people. We caught a glimpse of him in that last report. He recently took over as the head of the Senegalese Great Green Wall Project. A wonderful colleague, the host of the French edition of Eco Africa, Bamba Fai, recently met up with him for an interview. Almost a year ago, you were appointed Senegal's director of the Pan-African Initiative, The Great Green Wall. What was your initial reaction when you realized that you were responsible for this reforestation project? My first reaction was, thank God, I can plant trees. Suddenly, I was the head of a reforestation project. I've always been interested in planting trees. Here we know how to cut trees down, but we don't plant them. The soil here is being damaged by the sun's extreme heat. It's a very difficult climate. It's 45 degrees even in the shade, and there's no shade. We can manage by encouraging people to help out with our plans by getting them interested in planting trees that will be useful to them. Senegal has played a key role in this initiative. If the numbers are accurate, more than 10 million trees were planted here. How exactly does one plant trees in the desert? Well, the majority of those 10 million trees have since died. That's unsurprising since there's no water in this region. I mean, we have to be honest. We have to find trees that can survive in this climate, like the date palm, for example. We want to create oases and bring in water. That way, the entire population, including women and young people, can continue to farm traditionally and plant vegetables. As of now, that all still comes from the capital, Dakar. This oasis should not only contribute to an improved quality of life, it should also expand ecotourism. 
After all, palm groves are always beautiful. Last but not least, we want to boost the incomes of people in the community by creating green jobs. Some critics accuse the project of not being forward-looking enough. Others say it's ineffective. What's your response to these criticisms? I think the Great Green Wall project is confined by international structures. You get the financial backing for the project, but in the end, you conduct studies, hold seminars, blah, blah, blah. But the money doesn't reach the places where it's most needed. That must change. These people have to take responsibility for what's happening here. The initiative is based on an agreement that includes 21 African countries. Which big challenges must you, as its director in Senegal, overcome if this partnership is to be successful? We should look at best practices in individual countries and support people who are already doing good things without our help. Because when we support them, things will go more quickly and our efforts are more likely to succeed. Our goal is to build a community with electricity and solar energy, as well as infrastructure that includes enough water for the plants there. Instead of pushing trash bins at the village entrance, we want to see forests and fruit trees. The green network will expand gradually into a sustainable economy. The mission of the Great Green Wall is a much bigger but no less noble cause. Ali Aydar, thanks for talking to us. But it's not only in arid regions like the Sahel where trees are suffering. In Germany too, Forests have been hit by the rising temperatures, long periods of drought and wildfires. So understanding how best to help forests recover and regenerate is more important than ever. A group of scientists in the eastern part of the country is now trying a new approach to revive forests that have suffered devastating fires. Whether beech trees, maples or aspens, Jeanette Blumroder and Pierre Ibish are always glad to see a new member of the family arrive. About 12 months ago, the two researchers began documenting changes, big and small, to this section of a forest ravaged by fire. That's what we we got what we hoped for. The ecosystem is starting to recover, and certain species are quickly appearing and spreading, such as these aspens. They've now brought about changes to the area that are in turn helpful for other species. In August 2018, a forest fire raised almost four square kilometers of woodland outside the town of Treuenbritzen in eastern Germany, an area larger than 500 soccer pitches. The usual practice after a forest fire is to clear the entire area and replant trees, as seen on this private land. But not in this case, thanks to a government-funded project. Here, dead trees are left standing. Local forester Dietrich Henke is testing an alternative solution, removing most of the dead pine trees and planting other species in their place. The idea is to create a mixed forest that's also home to oaks, poplars and other deciduous trees. I first wanted to see which species of tree I could use and how old they need to be before being transplanted. Carrying out tests is important to get the full picture. And that's where the forester brought in the expertise of these researchers. They're here to find out the best way for a forest to be able to regenerate and become more climate resistant, with or without human assistance. The researchers take a hands-off approach, limiting their work to observing which plants and animals settle in the habitat. It's a rare opportunity. It's now standard procedure to see to it that we repair the damage that humans have done. All too frequently, we do not give nature the time or space to do that itself and that deprives us of the chance to learn from nature.
Among the things they have learned is that in addition to providing shade, deadwood also enhances the soil when it falls to the ground. It creates more humus, which gives the soil more moisture. The work Henke has carried out on his test areas is on a smaller scale than is common in conventional forest management. He left a number of dead trees standing. Leaves have also been spread to keep the soil moist and protected during drought. We're seeing large-scale forest fires in the region, and that's going to continue, so we need to learn how to respond. And that's why researcher Jeanette Blumröder is here. She's been collecting data on soil humidity and temperature, which plants and animals settle there, and how all these factors impact on the ecosystem. Our data shows that natural rejuvenation far exceeds the number of trees planted by humans. We've seen up to three times the amount of poplars naturally resettling compared to the pine or oak trees that were planted on the area. The researchers are also part of an international network. They're eager to hear about the experiences of colleagues in the US and Mediterranean countries and to learn if and how forest ecosystems can be made more robust. One thing a number of studies show is that even the remains of trees killed or damaged in severe fires help the forest ecosystem rebound, which supports the argument of letting nature be. Wow, it is interesting to see how nature can regenerate itself, but it is going to take years for that forest to be able to store large amounts of carbon dioxide again. That's just one reason why we need to reduce our carbon emissions as much as possible. And one of the best places to start with is the construction industry. Worldwide, it is now responsible for nearly 40% of global carbon dioxide emissions, an alarming statistic that prompted one young woman in South Africa to take action. I'm very Shava and I'm so excited for you to see one of the projects that we've been working on here in Johannesburg. Let me take you onto the construction site. Vera Shabe stands out in many ways here. As one of very few women on the ground, she's also the first female boss for many here. Being treated as an equal is all part of the job. So at the end of the day, I'm on site, I've got my safety boots, I will climb whatever I need to, to make this happen for my client. And I think that that's the main thing, is really just making sure that people see us as equal when we are women on construction sites and making sure that there's always honor and respect because I studied as much as any other man studied to be able to become a mechanical engineer. But being a female construction boss isn't her only USP. Various engineering company, Green Design, does something a little different. They specialize in green buildings. That means using energy efficient materials and smart designs to save electricity. It's a rather niche industry. There are only a handful of similar companies on the continent. With everything that we do, we consider green. So that's part of how we do our designs. It's not a line item. It actually is integrated in how we've designed it. So we've got LED lights, lots of natural lights coming into the space. Vera herself tries to lead a green lifestyle. The 33-year-old sold her car to reduce her carbon footprint and takes public transport back to her office. When Vera started her company after university, she had a clear goal in mind, tackling climate change through construction. Because we are the most vulnerable continent when it comes to climate change. Buildings emit 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions and Almost 60 to 80 percent of that can actually be avoided. As engineers, we are the greatest source of the problem, but we're also the solution. Vera's company has worked on 15 construction projects since she started in 2016. She also hosted lectures and workshops throughout the continent to give the green building sector a boost. In the upmarket business district of Santon, where Vera's office is, there are already several green building projects. About 600 are certified in South Africa. The city of Johannesburg is currently drafting a green buildings policy, but Vera has an even bigger vision. 
More than 60% of the people on our continent are youth and I really just want to see them grow and I really want to see them understand climate and really just like lead our continent forward into the future. It's a long journey, Vera admits, but she is willing to take it one project at a time. A long journey indeed, and unfortunately, the same can be said of effort to expand access to electricity. Almost a billion people worldwide still lack access to a reliable supply of power. That means they have a hard time lighting their homes, storing foods, using phones or the internet. It's simply a fact that electricity improves people's quality of life. It does indeed increase, and without central electricity supplies, many homes in Africa need local or off-grid solutions. And we all know how polluting they can be. Such think of diesel generators, but fortunately, more and more simple, clean solutions are becoming available. Here is an example from Kenya. Radio, a charging system, and lights. These are all now standard features in Feva Karimi's home. But many other households in the area still rely on kerosene lamps, which are dangerous and unhealthy. Feva Karimi generates her electricity from solar panels. She has a small home grid. It's a big change. Before, we were paying 55 shillings a day for electricity. We'd have power for a while, and then it would be cut off. But with the solar panels, when we pay 55 shillings, it stays on. And so we have enough light to get the children ready in the morning. It's on all the time. Karimi and her husband are paying for the solar energy system in installments. In eight months, it will be paid off. Although more than 70% of Kenyans have access to electricity, in semi-rural areas like here in Kajiado, only 40% do. To close the gap, a company called D-Light has set up stores around Kenya that sell solar products for home and small businesses. Esther Njoroge runs one of the stores. She sells everything from lamps to TVs and solar home systems. Today, one of her technicians is going to install a system on the outskirts of Kajiado. John Otia is a local pastor. He decided to equip his new home with a solar energy system. The technician explains how it works. It can be installed in just a few hours. By contrast, getting connected to the public grid can take months. And in just two years, Otia will have the environmentally friendly system paid off. This one uh, is uh, the quickest way of getting the, the light. The electricity is not promisable. Sometimes, especially in the, in the, in the, the area like any far from the, any from, from the town, sometimes we, you can, can miss it for one month, what not. D-Light's Kenyan offices are located in Nairobi. Co-founder Ned Tozan has come from the U.S. to discuss future strategies for Africa. The social entrepreneur is now focusing on helping people who have recently lost access to energy sources. It is an injustice that you have 1.3 billion people in the world who have to still burn kerosene for lighting uh, when the light bulb was invented more than 100 years ago. This doesn't make sense. Technologies like mobile banking have made it easy for D-Lights to establish itself in Kenya. It's the world's second biggest market for solar energy after India. Tozan and his colleagues are now hoping to expand into other markets in Africa. If we're going to provide universal energy access, solar is going to be a critical part of that equation. Feva Karimi's small solar grid means that she no longer has to buy electricity tokens and her children have enough light to see when they are drawing. The clean energy source even powers a security light in her front yard. It helps deter thieves at night. In the evenings, we leave the outside light on, and all our things are safe, even if we leave the washing outside. Because when the light's on, people can't tell if we're at home or not. Access to solar power has made her family's life a lot easier. And unlike other sources, the sun's energy will always be there.
And hopefully you are feeling more energized yourself after hearing about all these people making a difference in their part of the world. I was certainly impressed by their ideas. That's it for today. See you again next week. I am Chris Alems, signing off from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you, Chris. All the best to you and our viewers. Do not forget to check us out on our social media platforms. Let us stay in touch. I am Sandra Twinovdio here in Kampala, Uganda, and I look forward to your company again next week. Oh, oh, oh.